Hello, good evening and welcome at another EAO Just Ask, your monthly live appointment with a leading expert in implant dentistry. My name is Gerrit Heikoop and I'm the host of this EAO channel and in this live video session we will try to answer as many questions as we can about the topic of prosthodontics and more specifically the implant abutment interface. And to do that, I'm joined tonight by Dr. Stefano Grazis, live from Milano in Italy. Stefano, good evening. Good evening to you, Gary. Good evening to everybody who has joined us tonight. Yeah, exactly. Well, we're very glad to have you with us. You have a private practice in Milano. You teach privately. You've also been a teacher on the EEO masterclasses, and you're the immediate past president of the European Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry. So a great expert to uh, have you with us. In the meantime, like always, I asked it in the chat to all the live viewers who are joining us tonight to let us know who they are and where they're joining us from. And uh, we already see some people from all over the world. Mitchell Pierce is with us from New Orleans in the United States. We have uh, Emmanuel Simeonidis, I should say that, live from Athens, who still remembers your EEO masterclass. Uh, we have Per Otterstad from Norway, Michael Payet once again from Graz in Austria. Hi, Michael. Victor Pallari, Corina Mirelia is with us from Romania, Nikos from Athens, Alfonso Gil. Hi, Stefano, he says. Hussam Hassan, everybody is back again. So uh, welcome. If you're just joining us, please let us know in the chat who you are so we really get this sense of community of all these people around the world who are joining to learn more about this very important topic, Stefano, because... You mentioned when we met, you said, um, well, I'm a prosthodontist. I've never placed an implant in my life, but I have restored many. <laughs> quite a few, quite a few. Yeah. yeah, you say I can really appreciate if I see one well done, but unfortunately I've seen many where there's some improvements possible, right? Yeah, but my passion has always been prosthodontics. So that's what I've uh, always liked to do, prosthodontics on teeth and prosthodontics on implants. But, you know, implant prosthodontics has been uh, the subject of my thesis when I was back in uh, specialty school in, in Seattle. So it's uh, really one of my passions. Yeah. And the promise of tonight is that hopefully our participants, whether it's live or in recording, will learn that it's possible to use any type of implants to get primary stability. But there's a few things we need to keep in mind. So we're very curious to learn that from you. Now, before we start, uh, we mentioned that you will probably uh, refer to certain products or uh, um, uh, certain uh, um, organizations and it's important that there's no conflict of interest so please uh, read off your uh, disclosures uh, to us before you start yeah i just want to make sure that people understand that even though i have been a consultant or i am a consultant for a number of companies um, what i talk about is what i do every single day and what i do every single day i do because i believe in it not because they pay me for it so I just wanted to make sure and get this out of the way before we start a topic where maybe some names will pop up. Clear and uh, very good you do that. In the meantime, our chat is going wild with people all the way from even New Zealand, South Africa, Paris, Croatia, Belgium, Syria. We're literally once again connected all across the globe. Now, tonight it's going to be quite technical, a little bit theoretical. We're going to learn a lot about biomechanics. But before we start, let's translate the topic of tonight to this clinical practice. Why is it important that we focus on this topic and what type of problems might we occur in our clinic that may lead to potential, well, better improvements or protocols when we think about the implant abutment design? Well, Garrett, uh, you know, whenever we do a uh, prosthesis on top of an implant, what we are aiming for is a stability and integrity of this complex, you know, of the implant, the abutment, and the prosthesis over time, and also stability of the surrounding hard and soft tissues. So this is our aim. This is the way, the premise to start any type of job. But then we may encounter issues. We may encounter complications and failures. Uh, it could be a loosening of a screw or a fracture of an abutment screw. It could be the fracture of an abutment uh, component, uh, such as this one in zirconia, or in the worst scenario, it could be the fracture of an implant. So these are the types of problems that maybe many people do encounter in their practices. 
And what I will try to do with our chat tonight is to just give you some pointers as to what I think are the important issues to check before you know, delivering your processes. And maybe also some help in making some uh, conscious choices and selections. So exactly. this is it. So, so very important complications that we want to prevent, right? And that prevention often starts right at the design and the implant uh, protocol. So what are some of the main causes uh, and reasons for these screw loosenings, the fractures and, and the, the trouble you just mentioned? As you can see in this uh, slide, there are actually many, many variables that may account for either screw loosening or even fracture or to, as I said before, in the worst case scenario, the fracture of the implant itself. So we need to understand the weight of these uh, variables, what role they play in a possible complication or even in failure. And the one thing that I wanted to immediately clear out of the way is the issue about the implant connection configuration. As my colleagues know very well, implants can be divided in two big families, those with an external type of connection and those with an internal type of connection. The external connections were the first ones to come onto the market at the end of the 70s, basically when they were introduced to the scientific community. And you know, for many years they've been criticized because of the limited height of this uh, external X uh, and therefore a li limited effectiveness to the off axis loads, which may bring more easily to instability. And there is also a certain rotational play between the abutment and the external X, so a high tolerance type of uh, situation. And all of these uh, have brought many people to look into internal connection designs because there's supposed to be a stronger type of connection more resistant to the opening of the joint between the abutment and the implant itself. And also they are supposed to provide better shielding of the abutment screw. This in turn is supposed to uh, become a situation that will reduce the stress in the surrounding bone and supposedly also reduce the incidence of screw loosening and fracture. My question is whether there is any scientific evidence to state that. And, yeah, and here at EAO, you know, we love the scientific backing. Eh? So uh, I hear you use the word should and supposed a lot. So uh, please enlighten I us. I do also because, you know, the more I start to look into the topic, the more I realize that many of my colleagues speak about internal connection implants as if they were all the same. But as you can see, for example, in this, uh, pictures, there are such a variety of possibilities in the internal connection world of, uh, you know, um, the way that the Batman couples with the implant itself. So you cannot treat internal connections as if they were all the same. And first of all, you need to recognize that they can be divided in two families those that have a flat to flat type of internal connection and those that have a conical connection. Flat to flat means that the abutment sits on top of the implant shoulder and the screw keeps the two together. And even though a portion of this abutment goes inside the implant, has no contact with the inner walls of that implant itself. The only contact is on the flat, head of the implant. Conical instead means that the portion of the abutment that goes inside the implant does contact a portion, a small or a large portion of the inner walls of this implant. And at that point, you need to understand that there may be differences also for what concerns the possibility of having contact uh, with the inner walls or no contact. Now, if it's just a contact on the rim, that doesn't really count very much. It's still, we're talking about internal connections without self-locking. But there are some designs where instead there is fairly an intimate contact between the abutment and the inner walls of the implant itself. 
and there may be even friction between the two. And if the configuration of the inner walls is less than 15 degrees, you know, a high amount of friction may be inserted. And therefore, once you remove the screw, not necessarily the button will just pop loose as it does with the configurations without self-locking. So as you can see, there are really many different types of configurations and they do not all act the same. And this slide, which I received from Anson Wiscott at the University of Geneva, really explains the fact that if you're looking at how does load transfer from the top, from the crown down into the implant, in the types of implant configurations to your left, well, those are all flat to flat types of load transfer configurations. The external or internal features that you see in blue are only anti-rotational features. They have nothing to do with load transfer. And it's just thanks to the fact that the screw that goes through the abutment into the implant keeps them together that the load applied to the crown is going to be transferred down to the implant itself. If instead you look at the two configurations to your right, then you have a different type of uh, uh, coupling between the abutment and the implant. These are internal connections with friction, so with an index. And therefore, there in that uh, bevel surface, you will have load transfer, and you may also have indexing depending on the, on the type of design. But, you know, look at this uh, diagram. You see in a flat to flat, the only contact is on the shoulder of the implant. The, the screw provides a clamping force, but all the stress is being transferred from the abutment to the implant on the shoulder. In the central diagram, the conical connection, then you have the contact is inside the implant on the inner walls, which are beveled. And therefore, again, the screw provides a clamping force to allow this force then to be transferred over to the implant. The third diagram, the one that says combination, it's actually something that doesn't work. You cannot combine these two different systems of, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, of contact between abutment and implant because this will not work at all. And uh, then there is the issue of what is a tolerance and what is a clearance. You know, tolerance is something that you need to have as small as possible in the flat to flat, but even the conical. Otherwise, you may have unsettling of the screw but you always need some clearance in order for these components to really fit in together. If you have an abutment that has a zero wall or an implant that has a zero wall inner cavity, there is no way that the abutment can contact those inner vertical walls. There must be clearance, otherwise the abutment will never fit. So this, you need to understand the difference between tolerance and clearance. And what is interesting is nowadays, we are seeing um, new implant designs with new type of configurations of their head. So some implants are getting away from having an interface at the bone level between an abutment and the implant itself. But the implant is provided with the abutment all in one piece and then the crown goes on top of it. And this is an extremely rigid connection and also you know, the best type of seal you may have at the uh, bone level. So this is uh, really- So St Stefano, I can imagine you described this very well. You described all the different configurations, but I guess our viewers are super hungry to kind of learn, okay, so Stefano, tell me, so what is best? Is there, is there a better or worse in these configurations or is it just important to understand how they work? Okay, I, again, I don't think that you can state that there is a best type of implant configuration. Many okay. implant configurations can work. What is really important is to try to understand how can you make this implant configuration 
configuration work properly. And mm -hmm. the problem is that uh, the external X type of implant configurations tend to be more prone to uh, issues, or at least they used to be more prone to issues because they were not the correct, the proper materials uh, for the screws. And there was not the proper understanding of what needed to be done in order to prevent the- um, Hold on, uh, Stefano, I'm gonna interrupt you. I think your mic has dropped off because uh, we now hear you very far away. <laughs> so while you, while you make sure that's fixed, I'm, go I'm gonna have a look at the chat. I see uh, still people joining us from all over the world, Brazil, Philadelphia, Dubai, Kenya, Athens just joining in. Your, uh, your, the, mic is, uh, the mic is back, I hope. Yes, so yeah, I, we were I talking about all the different configurations. Properly at this point, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you okay, okay now. Let's great. see if it stays fixed. It will. <laughs> yeah. So the different configurations, they all different. You said the, the external design used to uh, be un more uncertain, but where are we now? Well, I think the one thing we need to really uh, explain before being able to provide a, you know, a, an answer to that question is to try to introduce and explain really the concept of preload. You see, preload is a concept, uh, but it's, a, it's something that many of my colleagues, I find out, do not fully understand. So what is really preload? Preload is nothing more than a, the tension that I introduce in a screw that is clamping together two structures. So I apply torque to a screw in order to elongate it so that I create pretension or I produce a preload. So basically, when I have to slap some metal that are you know, flat to flat and they are put together by a screw and I hand tight the bolt and the, screw and the nut, I take the two handles, I apply a force onto the two handles and if I only hand tightened the bolt to the screw, I may be able to slightly separate them. But now if I apply a, a higher torque to this screw, then the screw gets kind of elongated. So I have introduced a preload into the system. And if I take this two, these two handles, it's gonna be much, much harder for me to separate these two slabs. So when you look at this in our world of a implant abutment um, crown setup, what I am talking about is introducing preload in the screws. Now, preload can be also defined by this formula, but basically the bottom line is that depending on the screw that you're using and the level, whether you're at the implant level or you're at the abutment level, you will apply a certain amount of torque, let's say 32 Newton centimeters. And in relationship to the type of screw that you're using, you will be inserting into the system a certain amount of preload. So you see here, 960 newtons at that level and 300 newtons of preload at the higher level. Now, why am I saying this and what is so important about the preload? If I want to keep my construction stable, that is if I want to prevent the screws from coming loose or even fracturing, I need to insert as high a preload as possible. And this is something that I can do depending on the type of components that I use on the type of screws in this case that I use. And the preload depends upon the dimension of the component and the material of the screw. So basically, as you increase the size of the component, keeping the same material, by definition, you have potentially increase the preload that you are able to produce. But also there has been a lot of evolution 
in the way that the different screws have been manufactured over the years. We started 30 years ago with titanium screws. Then we switched to gold screws. Now we're using screws with a certain type of coating. And the aim of this evolution is to allow the clinician to increase the preload inside the construction. And so you need to understand how these screws have evolved over time. Now, some companies have achieved higher preloads by providing you large screws or relatively large screws. Others have been able to decrease the size of the screw somehow thanks to the use of certain gold alloys. Others still have been able to provide the same amount of preload by decreasing even further the dimension of the screw thanks to other evolutions and the possibility of applying certain coatings to these screws. And to me, the smaller is the screw in a way it's better because at the occlusal level, I will have a smaller hole. This is something never to un underestimate. But it is important to also understand that if you want to apply the proper torque in order to get the proper preload, you need to use screws with a certain head design. I remember when I started 30 years ago, I was using the slot design of the screwdriver. Nowadays, I don't see any system providing slots as their you know, preferred design for the screw. And instead you have had the introduction of all sorts of other designs that are able more effectively to transfer the torque to the screw in order to increase preload. You know, for example, the star is certainly a very effective design, but also the hexagonal, the Allen design is very effective. Then you have other companies that have created their own type of design. This is like a clover leaf design, extremely effective in a small diameter to transfer high torques to the screw without deforming the head of the screw, which is a big issue with some systems. Also, what has happened over the years that the number of threads has decreased and also that calibrated torque devices have been recommended. And this carrot is another important issue for anybody you know, doing implant prosthodontics. You need to have in the office either a mechanical or a electronic type of device that is able to apply calibrated torque according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Otherwise, you cannot have a feeling, you know, by just hand tightening of how much torque you're applying to that uh, uh, screw. And therefore you will never be sure of the preload that, that you're able to produce. So depending on the uh, implant manufacturer, depending on the abutment that they provide you, they will recommend a certain amount of torque, again, also according to the diameter of the platform, you know, whether you're using small implants, regular implants, or wide platform type of implants. So you need to see this. And nowadays in the, in the catalogs, you get all this information very, very easily. One thing that a group of uh, uh, clinicians and researchers from the University of Washington in Seattle in, and Loma Linda has pointed out is that if you're using a manual torque wrench, you really need to check whether it's delivering the proper torque or not. So you need to calibrate it from time to time because these devices, they end up in the autoclave and therefore they are steam sterilized and steam sterilization may alter their behavior. So you really need to check this at least once a year, maybe more often. And this is the conclusion of these uh, researchers and also what they find out in a survey that they sent around to 400 dentists is that very, very few, we're talking about maybe 25 out of 400, do worry about calibrating 
this type of devices. These are other types of devices that are able to provide the, the proper torque, but I don't like this device because it requires both hands to be used at the same time and that is not easy. But to come to the end and try at this point to answer to your question, regardless of what type of implant configuration you're using, external or internal, if you're able to deliver the torque that is being recommended by the manufacturer, you're able to decrease or eliminate the possibility of that screw to unsettle. Of course, occlusion has always a big role in all of this. So the recommendation is always to check occlusion, not only the day of the delivery, but also later on. But the bottom line is you need to have a torque device a wrench or an electronic device in order to provide and deliver the torque that produces a preload. If you only do hand tightening, then you will incur in a high incidence of screw loosening. And this is particularly true with external X type of designs. But you know, I've used external X now for over 30 years and I can assure you that the amount of situations where I had to deal with an unsettled screw or a loose screw has been really, really very, very small. And last thing, Garrett, and I know you want to talk to me. <laughs> no, it, no, 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 no. In every day's practice, what I need is not a torque wrench. I need a screwdriver. That's what I need to do all my maneuvers. The torque wrench is something that I pull out of the cloth of my drawer only the day in which I deliver the restoration the last time, but never before. And so to have something like a device like this that is able to screw in and unscrew very quickly and safely my, um, my uh, structures, uh, provisional or definitive depends, is something that is really very, very useful for me. The torque wrench I will use on the oh. Okay. You wanna see one case? I can show you one case, Garrett. <laughs> yeah, I was slightly distracted by a sound that just came in. Yeah, no, no. Uh, show me a case just to make sure I wanna I wanna make sure we all really understand. So you say we started off that one of the, the key clinical applications that, uh, or complications that we see is screw loosening. Right. You showed us all the different designs and basically now you conclude it doesn't really matter which design you use as long as you will basically say, read the manual, calibrate your devices and make sure you apply the proper preload. And check your me, and check your Exactly. To me, uh, that almost sounds too simple. So here's a, here's a difficult question for you. Why is it important that tonight we draw attention to this? Why is it not just every dentist doing this already? What happens? Well, because, you know, in talking to a lot of my colleagues, I see that many people do not understand the concept of preload. They think that hand tightening a screw should be enough. And both when you're dealing with single teeth, such as this one, or multiple implants uh, that are joined together. And this is instead not true. You need to apply torque according to the manufacturer's instructions with the proper device. This is really the most important thing. What I wanted to show you in this case, this Please. is one of my oldest uh, single teeth done with an external X type of uh, uh, implant design. And back then, uh, I manufactured an alumina abutment, uh, which was customized. And on top of it, I put a metal ceramic crown. And the, you can see the vertical lever arm that I had uh, between the incisal edge and the top of the implant. And again, this is an external X type of implant, machined surface. And this is a situation 18 years later you know, for 18 years, this uh, tooth never had any issue with the uh, screw loosening, screw unsettling. And, you know, this is the weakest type of configuration that I am supposed to be using. And still, you know, this type of performance I have seen over and over and over. 
Exactly. Well, impressive and an important message. In the meantime, I see in the chat, uh, Gerald is playing some trivia with us, but let me invite you all, if you're still watching us, we are live. And if you have any questions that you would like to propose to Stefano Gracias, please use the chat and I will relay them on, uh, on your behalf. Um, before we take some more questions and also some questions that we received uh, beforehand, um, let's briefly touch on the topic of material choice. There's a lot of discussion and debate about that in the field of implantology. Does, does the material, type of material, have any effect on this, uh, Stefano? Okay, uh, many years ago, we're talking about now in 2011, I think, the EAO invited me to one of their consensus uh, conferences. And this is exactly the type of topic that they asked me to search. That is whether there was any evidence that one material uh, metal, whether it is titanium or gold, would have been better than ceramic as far as screw stability, screw fracture, and so on and so forth. So back then, I did uh, quite a wide uh, literature search. Uh, I was able to find uh, quite uh, a lot of material on metal abutments, both on external and internal configurations. And back then, there was relatively little material on instead on zirconia abutments on either external or internal configurations. But to make a long story short, and this is a research that was then published on the Clinical Oral Implant Research Journal, and I can show you just uh, the inclusion criteria of that, but I need to share my screen first. I know that, so I will do that right away before you tell me, Stefano, you need to screen to share your screen. <laughs> no, you, are a, you are a master at this. So yeah, no, please I, talk us through. What did you find in the review? Well, we basically found that, that there was not a whole lot of difference in the sense that, you know, it was really interesting in this. You know, first of all, I looked only at single implants because I, single implants are the ones that are subjected to more torsional loads. They may bring more easily about uh, screw unsettling. I did not check multiple units because it didn't make much sense to me. And as I said, I look at metal abutments and zirconia abutments. So back then there were not many studies and I would go immediately to the conclusions, which I still think uh, it's very valid. You know, in those papers, they really showed that the screw loosening was a big problem with external connection implants, but there was a but. And the but is that many of those studies did not apply standardized protocols, did not use the proper screws, they did not insert the proper preload. And once these screws were replaced with the proper screw and the torque that was supposed to be applied was applied, the problem was eliminated even in external X. And with the internal, you know, uh, there is less of an issue if you wish, but it's not necessary that the internal are better than the external. The zirconia uh, uh, instead, the zirconia, let me run through the zirconia. Back then there were not many studies on it. And certainly, Zirconia has proven to be a good material. The only recommendation I feel I can make based upon what I read and what I saw personally is I would never use a full Zirconia abutment in an internal type of configuration. And I think that most physicians nowadays have understood that and they will provide you a metal component, a metal link that goes inside the internal configuration implant onto which the zirconia button is then cemented. This is definitely a much safer way to go. But for example, you could use a full zirconia abutment on uh, external X implants without a problem. I have not witnessed issues with screw unsettling even when I did that. But you will see that most of the systems nowadays will tend to suggest to glue 
the zirconia abutment onto some sort of a metal base, the so-called tie base. This is what you know most of the people would use. We could use prefabricated tie bases, so we could make uh, you know our own tie bases depending on to the situation. In this particular case, we used a, a custom-made metal base onto which a lithium disilicate uh, ceramic core was bonded and on top of it a lithium disilicate crown was then bonded and this is a situation 10 years later so what i'm saying is that again the material itself does not seem to make uh, to have a role or significant role in uh, um, this type of complications provided that you insert the proper torque and you have the proper preload. We are always going back to that. I'm sorry if I seem to be a repeat. No, yeah, but if, if that's the key message, we need, to, um, we need to keep repeating that. I have a question. You talked about the importance of preload. You showed us the history or, or the developments where the dimensions uh, led to more preload, the materials led to more preload. Then obviously the logical question that came from uh, Alfonso Gil tonight, he says, um, so what are the consequences of excessive preload? Yeah, because you keep mentioning the word proper pre uh, preload. So Obviously, more is not always better. There is a limit, of course, before, because then we already might fracture. Or what is the risk well, here? Generally speaking, if you um, apply a preload that is excessive, that is higher than what the company has recommended, you may incur in one of two problems. One is that you are ruining the top of the screw. You're modifying it, you're distorting it, and therefore you may have a hard time unscrewing it afterwards because the screwdriver does not fit properly. In mm -hmm. extreme cases, what you will see is that the head of the screw will just pop off. It will just fracture off because you have exceeded its tensile force. And uh, if that happens, usually it's not a big deal because once you remove the crown, the crown will just remove. Uh, the screw itself has no friction with the in inner threads of the implant once you have removed the top of it. So you are able to unscrew the portion of the, of the screw that was broken inside fairly easily. I, I don't usually have a problem. You know, the, the issue may occur if a patient has a multiple unit bridge, which is a screw retain bridge, and without even being aware of it, he has fractured one of the screws. The screws usually fractures around the neck area. And uh, the other screws are still, are still intact and they keep uh, this in, in position. But over time, there is a little bit of play. The portion of the screw that is fractured off may ruin the initial thread, the inner thread of the implant. So when you finally become aware of the problem, you remove the, 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 the bridge from the patient and you try to retrieve the portion of the screw that is inside, you may have an issue there because the start of the thread of the implant thread, inner, inner implant thread may be ruined and may prevent from, from uh, unscrewing it, that portion of the broken screw. Exactly. So, so it seems that you're saying that there, there might not be any direct risks during the procedure or not even in the primary stability, but the, the real problems may occur once you ever have to take something out, the threads might be broken, the screw head might be... Uh... You know, you're, you're certainly, you know, the idea of applying an excessive uh, torque to a screw and in a way ruining the bond, uh, outer bond between the implant and the bone, is a possibility. It has really never occurred to me, but maybe in softer bone it may, it may happen. But again, that would be a gross mistake made by, by the clinician. They may have this type of radical and extreme. Which, which, which will not happen if you carefully read the manuals from the manufacturers, if you have a calibrated uh, screwdriver and all the, the points you just said. Um, well, a follow-up question, and that's happening in the chat right now. Alfonso says also, so what do you know about the, the margins? What is, what is the flexibility that you have within these uh, recommended uh, torques? 
And then also Peter, Peter Hunt is already adding. He says most companies recommend a torque setting which does not exceed 25% of the force needed to rupture of the screw. What is your... Well, Peter Hunt uh, was one of my teachers when I was a student at the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> one of my sharpest uh, teachers as somebody who has always <laughs> pointed out what I was not doing proper. So thank you, Peter, for your... Uh, you know, for your input and your question. Uh, again, I mean, we must trust the companies from which we are buying our implants and the implant components. For example, I'm very much in favor of always using original components also for the prosthetic portion. Many of my colleagues tend to buy third party components. And this to me is not a very smart investment in the long run. So again, they design the implant walls and the abutment screws in such a way that we can safely provide the proper preload in the system without ruining neither the screw nor the implant itself. I showed at the beginning of the lecture a, a, an example of an implant that was fractured through the neck area. That implant to me was not well designed because the thickness of the wall was too insufficient. And also the type of metal of titanium that had been used was not of the proper strength. Nowadays, I know many different companies that really have done their homework and what they are providing is something that I can consider really safe. To me, to, to see implant fracture is a rarity. And they usually are implants of older designs where the quality control was not as good as this. So coming back to the questions that you're asking, you know, if you follow the recommendations, I don't see why you should exceed them. I mean, it's not like if you apply a higher, to a higher torque in order to, you know, because you want to get better uh, preload, you're necessarily doing the good thing. What they're recommending is enough. Nowadays, what we're seeing is that thanks to the evolution in the coating of these screws is with the same thicknesses of materials, we are indeed able to get higher preload. You know, the coating decreases the fr friction. That's why we're able to apply a higher torque without ruining neither the external thread of the screw nor the internal thread of the implant. I think that taps right into a question that Meli Dva is writing. Could you comment, and then I get back to the discussion on internal, external, because I'm seeing that, guys. Um, could you please comment on the use of sealants prior to the abutment fixation? Is that something you would recommend? Is it necessary? I would Does never, matter? never recommend to do that. First of all, if the uh, components are well machined, once they sit on top of each other and you apply the proper torque, they have a very intimate uh, type of adaptation. Nowadays, the, uh, that's why I was talking about quality machining. I know of a company that is able to guarantee a two micron interface between their implants and their abutments. Once they are set one on top of the other and the proper torque is applied to the screw two microns is basically a seal. It's mm -hmm. basically a seal. And when you remove the abutments for these implants, you can see a certain aspect of the surrounding tissues, which is indicative of the fact that there is no percolation of bacterial fluids. So you have a very stable type of relationship. So no, I would never recommend to use such a, a solution. Clear, clear. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, when you started to explain the importance of uh, stability that design, all the different designs could work. You explained external, internal. Now, Gerald Nisnik has been active in our chat um, and he has also been pointing out that he literally says internal is better than external. All companies, including Noble, have changed their product focus. Um, so I'd like you to comment on that, but I'd like you also then quickly follow through to the question or the comment of Per Ottostad joining us from Norway. He says, should you avoid using external and internal connections in the same multi-unit construction? So again, he's, he's broadening that up and still people are looking for a definitive answer on you. 
Shine a light. Why does it matter and why not? Well, Garrett, you do not know who Jerry Nisnik is. <laughs> no, I don't. I do. But, I do. Yeah. I actually met Jerry. I probably doesn't even remember that. But I met him 1987 or 88 uh, in Seattle when, when I was a student, a grad student back there. And uh, he's a brilliant mind, a brilliant clinician. He's the one who designed one of the earlier internal connection implants. Definitely. That's so what he, knows, he was referring he to earlier. Yeah, yeah, well. yeah. There is yeah, no question yeah. about it. You know, and as he said, as he pointed out, I would say that the vast majority of the new designs that have been introduced in the last 20 years is internal. Why is it internal? Because, you know, for many um, clinicians, it's much easier to feel whether the implant abutment is going inside the implant properly or not. Uh, there is shielding and everything else. So there is no question that the, the pendulum has swung toward the, the internal connections. But, you know, again, not all internal connections are the same. What I'm saying is that, for example, I still use external X in fully edentulous patients that I need to treat with a full arch type of prosthesis. I find that very convenient also because, and you know, I'm now going to answer the second question that you were posing to me. Generally speaking, these type of situations we rehabilitate with a multi-unit abutment. So at that point, uh, whether under, underneath there is an external X or an internal X doesn't really make much of a difference because, because you have multi-unit abutments for all types of configurations of implants. And at that point, it's, I find it much easier to create a prosthesis that I can check easily whether it's passively fitting or not and easy to manage. And also the... Um, uh, as that question was inferring, I don't have a big problem in joining external configuration to internal configurations, but in a bridge, it doesn't really make much, make, makes much sense to do that if you're going directly to the head of the implant. If you're creating a prosthesis that goes inside the implant and not on a multi-unit abutment. With internal configurations, it's enough to have a slight divergence or convergence. And it's really an issue to be able to fit passively these uh, uh, structure, superstructures. So this is why in multiple unit uh, type of situations, my preferred solution is always to apply a multi-unit abutment and therefore that nullifies whatever platform you have underneath and the insertion and removal of the prosthesis becomes extremely easy. So, you know, I agree with Jerry. Nowadays, most of the systems are internal connections. There are certain advantages. What I try to demonstrate is that even if you're using external, doesn't mean that you're going to have a higher percentage of failures. Very clear. Well, thank you very much. And thank you also, Gerald, for being so active in our chat tonight. Now, before we move on, because uh, this is EAA Just Ask Live. People are writing questions. You're answering off the cuff and you're doing a great but job. Jerry, are you going to forward to me all the questions at the end? Because I want to see what Jerry has asked. This definitely, time. definitely, definitely. We'll make sure. And let me also say that to all the viewers, this entire session will be available on the EAO channel, the YouTube channel of the EAO, where you're now watching this. So if you haven't done so, hit subscribe right now so you'll be the first to, uh, to know uh, to follow that we also always ask through our eao social media channels if people want to submit a, a case or a question in advance and uh, we received one from johan cosse and i'd like to go uh, to that one right now because i think johan is looking at his clock is like are they still going to take my case uh, it's quite a long story i'll read out uh, the second half and I'll, I'll invite our viewers to listen he writes we placed over 6,000 osteotide implants over the years and what strikes me all the time is the following. Osteotide implants had a hybrid design, meaning a machined neck, an external hex, and we used to place gold abutments and PFM, which means porcelain fused metal, I had to look that up, high precious crowns. Now, after 15 years, I see a stable bone to implant contact and the remaining residual teeth fail in a patient with poor dental hygiene. Now, here comes the question to you. I see different patterns, 
for example, more bone loss after this period of time in implants that have an internal hex. Between brackets, he says, which are supposed to be superior, but I think we just tackled that, um, and rough implants. So let me rephrase, after this period of time in implants uh, that have an internal hex and rough implants. Can you explain this to me, he asks. Well, first of all, uh, to my knowledge, there is no evidence that internal X type of implants um, are associated with a higher amount of bone loss uh, than external X, okay? That, to my knowledge, is not the issue. Uh, the issue that is posing, from what I understand, is first of all, the placement of implants in periodontally compromised patients where uh, the presence of plaque creates inflammation and bring, bring about bone loss around the natural teeth. It may as well bring about bone loss around implants. You know, uh, again, the EAO has promoted several consensus conferences where this message has been uh, said loud. You're not supposed to place implants in periodontally compromised patients or people who have active periodontal disease because the chance that you're gonna have bone loss is much higher than in patients without any periodontal issues. Having said that, if you are placing um, implants in a patient that does not have periodontal issues at that time and may develop them in the, in the future, well, uh, nowadays there is still a lot of controversy as far as what is the best outer surface uh, of the implant in order to decrease the chance of periodontitis. And I will show you again a very quick, uh, um, a quick uh, slide because this is the object uh, of another publication that I, um, uh, I published just recently in 2020. Together with a group of colleagues, we looked at, at different issues relative to the head of the implant. They may contribute to a stable peri-implant uh, soft and hard tissue. And we looked in the literature also at the differences between implants with a smooth color, such as one that uh, your uh, question is addressing, or rough to the top. And basically what uh, certainly, uh, you know that rough surfaces have been introduced in order to speed up the os integration. Uh, and also to create a barrier to bacterial invasion. But also over the years, rough surfaces have been in a way identified as those that can bring about more bone loss in patients who are susceptible to peri-implantitis. And therefore the conclusion that we drew back then regarding this topic, uh, is that no clinically relevant differences in marginal bone level preservation were found between machine colors and rough to the top, but the smooth or machined surfaces may be better in patients who are at risk for peri-implantitis. So this is a conclusion that we draw back then. So, you know, I always try to avoid uh, uh, placing implants if I know that the patient is uh, susceptible to periodontal disease. If I do place them, first of all, you need to really implement a very strict uh, hygiene uh, protocol all the time, not just during the therapy, but also afterwards. And second, I would choose an implant designed that has a machine color, but no difference between internal and external uh, design. That is not, as far as I know, a factor that does contribute to more or less bone loss. Clear. Well, thank you, Johan Cosse, for sending in this question. I hope this answer was very clear. If not, we'll see your follow-up questions pop up in the chat. Um, great job, uh, Stefano. We're, we're moving on. I have two questions for you from uh, Gianni Salvini. Oh, yeah. Question number one. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm reading out the name, so you know where they come from. Question number one. What may cause repeated loosening of the screw? And I'm going to steal the answer. Well, you should have applied the proper torque, right? That's probably the answer uh, of that one. Only. But, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold, hold, hold. Okay. Second question. And in the bad case of screw fractures, are there any tricks 
uh, yeah, of screw fracture, I should say, are there any tricks to remove it? So first one, what is going on when it keeps loosening or what could be going on? Okay, and first of all, what we need to ask Gianni is whether it's referring to single teeth situations or to multiple units that are splint together by a superstructure, by a bridge. Okay, in a single tooth, a repeated screw loosening may be due to, for example, the presence of impurities and, and you know, dirt in the interface. That's one possibility. You know, we apply the proper preload. We assume that he has done that, and mm -hmm. occlusion can also play a role in that. So a hard uh, off-axis occlusal contact can cause that. But if we are talking about multiple units, then this is something very, very important because we hear a lot about the importance of passive fit of mm -hmm. implant superstructures on multiple implants. This is actually something that to me is very important to explain because it shows or it demonstrates why you could have a higher incidence of uh, screw loosening in these type of uh, situations. And to help me out, I'm gonna show you just a slide. So for example, you have two arches, edentulous arches with a complex superstructure, which is screw retained to six implants in the top and four implants in the bottom. And we hear that these superstructures need to be passively fitting. Why is that? Because it goes back to the issue of preload. In the sense that if you have a superstructure that does not fit passively on all implants, you may still be able to close that interface by screwing that screw together because of deformation in the superstructure, in the bone, whatever. But so, you know, you see here there is a small gap between mm -hmm. superstructure and, and abutment. I apply my torque and I shut that down. I close it down. I bring them in, in, in intimate contact. But what happens then? You have just wasted part of your preload to keep actively together an interface that otherwise would be open. So at this point, what happens whenever the patient chews on the superstructure, the forces are being transferred to the entire abutment and implants uh, complexes will may cause uh, the screw unsettling because basically there is less force available to counteract this opening. Part of the preload, you know, preload is 100. You have just wasted 50% of the preload to actively close an interface that without the screws would be open. So now you only left 50% of the preload to counteract further opening during the function. Also, the other implication is that you, by closing that interface actively, you are actually inserting to the system stress, which is present 24 hours a day. And this could also explain not only mechanical issues of screw unsettling and fracture, but also maybe bone loss. This is another controversial topic. So, uh, Stefano, what is your recommendation then? If I happen to have not my perfect passive fit, do I go back to the drawing board? Apparently, I cannot just screw it tight. Well, you know, this used to be a big issue back then when we were casting superstructures to multiple implants. Nowadays, uh, since the introduction of the CAT CAM technologies, this has become much less of an issue. The only issue is this. If you're still, you know, working the analog world like I am, what is extremely important is to make sure that you use a proper impression technique because you need to have a model that replicate, replicates exactly the clinical situation. Because nowadays, we have technologies that are able to manufacture even complex superstructure on six, seven, eight implants, passively fitting on that model. But if that model does not reflect the clinical situation, you put into the mouth and then it doesn't fit properly. So personally, to this day, and I've done that for the last 25 years, in fully dangerous cases, but also in partially dangerous cases, but there is, you know, that's a topic for another day, 
I take my impressions with dental stone. I use stone, I do not use elastomeric materials in order to capture the copings, in order to be absolutely sure that I produce a model that replicates a clinical situation. And I am so confident about this that I don't even go through a trying step of a temporary superstructure. I have the, the dental technician manufacture the definitive restoration immediately because I have witnessed that. Now we are going more and more towards uh, digital solutions and digital um, impressions. And with digital impressions, you may also uh, get an extremely precise virtual model, provided that you understand certain principles. It's not tonight, it's not the time to really go into that. <laughs> but this is something feasible also in the digital world, not only in the analog world. Beautiful. And uh, all our viewers have been watching the live chat on the side, and you've just magically answered Melly Dva's uh, question. She's now inviting you for a full debate on digital workflows or not. Let me invite Melly to become a member of the EAO to look into the EAO library where you find, for example, from the past EAO digital days, a great debate in many topics on digital versus analog Absolutely. workflows. So uh, let's park that one. How about that second question from um, uh, uh, Johnny about what happens if you have a fractured screw? Any tips okay. or tricks to get them out? Okay. You should know that. I told him that. I know, but he wants you to, to, <laughs> to tell all of us. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's assume that you have a situation like the one I was describing before. And due to the fact that the, um, this procedure didn't come off right away, the portion of the screw that it was sticking out had the chance to actually ruin the beginning of the inner thread of the um, implant. Now, in situations like this, you try to unscrew the portion of the screw that is inside that you're not able. So what I do with an explorer, I actually try to push that fragment deeper down into the cavity because usually there is always space at the bottom in order to free up access to the start of the thread. At that point, I take out of my box one of those uh, um, steel screws that is like a threader and being a steel harder than titanium by easing it into the thread you're able to clean up the start of the thread remove the little particles that are you know kind of bevels that have been ruined by the portion of the screw that was broken and you're re-threading at the end the beginning of the screw. Once you have done that, you remove the steel screw, you take your explorer and you're able to unscrew easily out the portion of the screw that was still uh, captured inside. And this to me has always worked out uh, properly. Again, this went very fast, so let me invite everyone. You can replay this video as many times as you want and step by step, see how you can get that uh, broken screw out. Um, a question from Maria Dusman. I hope I pronounced that correctly. She's asking, should neighbor implants be always connected uh, when, uh, or can we also do them separately? Okay, this is another very good question. And I wish I had the other presentation to show you. Okay. Uh, Describe it as vividly as you've done the no, unscrewing no, of a broken screw. Actually, there are several papers that have addressed this topic uh, in a scientific manner uh, with the clinical trials uh, followed up over time. One of the papers is actually done by my late friend, Paolo Vigolo, uh, who was uh, also an active part of the EAO for many, many years. And basically they did, uh, he did run a clinical study where on one side, the multiple implants were left alone, were left single, and the other side, they were splinted. And they checked over five years, uh, different clinical um, variables, clinical criteria to see whether there were any differences over time. And they could not find any differences, clinically relevant differences that would suggest that you must uh, splint together neighboring implants. As a matter of fact, personally, for many, many years, I have followed a certain approach in the rehabilitation of patients without posterior teeth, where we would place 
one implant for each missing posterior tooth. This was done in the, with the idea of over-engineering our cases. As you know, in the posterior portion of the mouth, higher forces are being produced. And now what I try to do is to distribute the forces over a highest number um, of implants as possible over larger implant surface as possible. So you could do that by placing multiple implants next to each other. And you could do that even without splinting them, provided that you are able to provide the proper occlusal contact. Splinting them to me is always something I would recommend to do if you are doubtful whether to leave them alone or put them together. For example, I have witnessed over many, many years, many patients with single posterior implants that have lost interproximal contact between one implant and other. And this is something that I've not witnessed also only between implant and teeth, but even between implant and implant because of bone remodeling. So just for that reason, I would suggest people whenever they can, to splint them together. But the reality is that there are no strong uh, evidence that you must do that, okay? Then we can get into all the discussion about uh, looking at the implant length with respect to the crown height, so crown to implant uh, ratio, quality of bone, entity of uh, forces being applied. There are many variables that you need to look at. But overall, this is what I was trying to say. Look up uh, the Paolo Vigolo, um, Jomi article that came out a few years ago. Clear. And if any of our viewers can quickly Google or find that article, they can post it in the chat right now so uh, people can find it as well. Uh, thank you for that clear explanation, Maria. I hope that was clear to you as well. I think it ties into uh, a question from Rawat Samarani, joining us from Lebanon. Um, he is also asking a question about a posterior dentition, where he says, would you recommend a three-unit bridge screw retained on two multi-unit abutments? For sure, and, yes. Okay. Why no, are you so sure about that? I mean, three-unit a three-unit bridge on two implants with multi-unit. So what we're talking about here is a screw retained solution whereby you have an implant in the bone, you have a multi-unit abutment which has been screwed with a very strong screw to the implant, and you have a three unit bridge being screwed with two screws that are much smaller onto the multi-unit abutments. I have done that hundreds of times. And again, provided that the bridge is passively fitting, provided that you have proper torque applied to the two screws and the occlusion is correct, you don't, I don't see issues. You know, one thing, a very interesting research that came out a few years ago, you know, uh, a lot of people in the posterior re re region are of course preoccupied with the effects of very strong forces being applied. And for many years I heard people and I did it myself, uh, that the best way to decrease off-axis loads on posterior implants was to make the occlusal morphology as flat as possible. This eventually was investigated by a group of clinicians. I do not recall right now the, the paper, but maybe I can provide it later, um, in which what they did, they did a clinical study, patients with two implants, with three unit bridges made in this way. And they inserted like a, a, a strain gauge inside the bridge. Now they made a bridge with a certain width, buccolingual width with very uh, deep uh, um, grooves and high cusps. They made another bridge with very flat occlusion. And they made a third bridge where the buccolingual thickness or width of the occlusal table was reduced by one third. And they checked uh, both uh, the loads being transferred in axis, off axis and everything else with two different consistencies of food. And what was really 
clearly demonstrated by them is that the one thing that is able to decrease the amount of stresses being transferred down the column is not flat or cuspy type of occlusion, but it's narrowing the buccolingual width of the crowns. This brings the occlusal table more on top of the implant head, decreases off axis forces and therefore decreases the lever arms that can contribute to uh, frequent unsettling or unscrewing of the screws or even fracture of the screws. So you need to check all of this, but in the posterior, always try to go for premolar size crowns. If I have a distal extension type of ridge, we always place implants with a premolar uh, size crown on top of it. Do not make big, uh, you know, uh, big uh, crowns on top of small, even regular implants. type of implants. Yeah, because of that of access load, which, which makes a lot of sense, very clear. In the meantime, Isabella Rochetta has provided the full title and the uh, authors of the paper you just referenced. So this is really becoming a uh, nice Isabella. teamwork tonight. Thank you, Thank you Isabella. The great um, looking at the clock, I think we're uh, nearing some of the last questions. I want to quickly uh, um, uh, propose this one to you from Jaco Nod, because it's very practical. And in the end, from all the biomechanics and all the technical and scientific stuff we talked about, we want to go back to Practical clinical advice. Jaco Nard is saying, should screws be retorqued after a few weeks? This is a very interesting question. Thank you very much for uh, providing it. Um, this is something that, again, can be linked to the type of uh, um, configuration that you have. For example, in the internal configurations that are conical, there has been reports of the fact that after a few days, the screws tends to loosen up because there has been settling of the abutment inside the, um, the implant. But again, I think this, at least in my experience, relates to older designs and where the machining tolerances were not as good as today. Today, we have such good finishing and such good tolerances, uh, you know, small tolerances, that I have not witnessed this settling, and I have not uh, seen situations where I, when going back after a week or a month, uh, I found out that the screw had come loose. Um, on, on flat to flat, again, if they are properly machined, that too, I have never had the need to go back a week later or a month later to re-torque these uh, um, this, uh, screws. If it happens to you, check the machine intolerances. Check, check the calibration. The, check occlusion and check the, the fact, and make sure that you apply the proper torque. Okay, and now Melly is following up. Melly, you're really in tune with the live moments. How, and how about after 10, 15 minutes? I don't even understand why she asked, but is, the, is that in the procedure? Is there yeah, because something there where some, you do it? You know, there is a, a, a paper that uh, came out with that recommendation. Frankly, I, I don't see that. Again, for the reasons that I stated before. Yeah. I, yeah. Again, if you have this issue, I mean, if you do see that after 10 minutes, 15 minutes or a day, you go back and despite the fact that you apply the proper torque in the first time, you have screw unsettling. There are many things you need to check. First is a machine intolerances. If you're talking about multiple unit bridges, check that they are passively fitting. Otherwise you have an issue. Very clear, very strong. Let me invite anybody who might have joined us later. We are now nearing the end of this EA Just Ask for February, but as soon as we stop, this entire episode will be available in recording. And please go back and watch the full beginning where Stefano explains all the different designs, then comes to his most important uh, point, and that is about, it's all about applying proper preload, and then all the questions you've been asking and uh, you've been answering. Um, Stefano, I think uh, we're nearing the end. If there's one thing that you would like to leave our viewers with, if they, if they only remember one thing, I kind of stole your thunder, but still, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Wow. Famous last words for just this EAO just asked on the implant abutment uh, interfaces. 
but look at the instruction manuals. I know we never have uh, <laughs> the tendency to do that anytime we buy something new, but in your implant instruction manual, you will find all the recommendations about which type of uh, torque to apply to the different screws uh, in order to in, in, include, insert um, preload that will prevent the screws from unsettling over time. So that's my final words. 75 minutes of EO just act results in RTFM, read the fucking manual, <laughs> right? That's, uh, no, I didn't say that. I bleep myself. Anyway, thank you so much for your, my time. And let me also congratulate and, and, and invite our audience tonight. You were very lively. Great questions. There's one comment that I saved uh, to last, uh, Stefano. There's a, there's a viewer joining us from Padava, he says, and it writes, I don't understand a thing but I'm so proud of my dad. It's Eduardo Gratis also <laughs> watching and joining. So even the family is proud of you. And I think judging by the comments that are coming in now, you made a lot of people happy. You enlightened a lot of people. And if you like this type of session, we are having one once every month. First Monday of the month is EAO Just Ask time. So make sure you note down March 1st, that is the next one. And make sure you hit the subscribe button here on YouTube at the EAO channel. So you'll be the first to know when a new EAO Just Ask is scheduled, when a new video is published and you become part of this great community. And if you haven't done so, please also check out whether EAO membership is something of value for you because you'd get a lot of access to a lot more of this educational content and all the programs that EAO has in store for you. Gary, That's it for tonight. Thank you very much to you for all the help you have given me and great moderation. And thank you to everybody who followed us tonight for the great questions and great uh, participation. Hope to see you in person soon. We all hope so. Exactly. Hope to see you all back next month, March 1st.